falsche Kunst ist im Begriff, sich zu einer wirklichen Darstellung leidenschaftlich bewegter Weltanschauung emporzuheben. Die Tendenz eines edlen und heroischen nationalen Wollens steht ihr auf der Stirne geschrieben. Unterdes aber wollen wir die großen Werte echter deutscher Kunst an das Volk heranbringen, auf das das Volk wieder zur Kunst zurückfinde. Das deutsche Künstlertum aber insgesamt verneigt sich in Ehrfurcht und Dankbarkeit vor dem Führer, dessen künstlerischer Dämon der deutschen Politik den mitreißenden Zug und dessen Politik der deutschen Kunst den leidenschaftlichen Impuls gab. Portraits of Hitler, of course, formed an important part of the fine arts. Unapproachable, he was never shown at home or relaxing. He was seldom painted with other people. The full-length figure symbolized his divine role. A seated portrait would have looked too relaxed and familiar, unless it were formal and enthroned. Hitler, the icy statesman, the artist, commander-in-chief of the army, always authoritative, sometimes pensive, gazing into the distance. Hitler in the pose of the victor, the map of the world at his feet, the bunker in the background. All these made wonderful postcards. They were sold by the million. Except for the obvious party portraits, there were relatively few overt political subjects. Paul Matthias Padua's painting, The Führer Speaks, is in the tradition of the genre paintings of the 19th century. If you remove the Hitler portrait, the radio and the fascist newspaper, it could hang in any museum. The Seven Deadly Sins looks harmless enough until one spots Chamberlain and Churchill as examples of gluttony. While cartoonists and filmmakers indulged in orgies of anti-Semitism, we find very few traces of it in the fine arts. In house and home, Jewish developers trick honest Germans out of their belongings. But on the whole, art was to concentrate on the good, and the good had to be beautiful, and consequently there was no place for the Jew in it. He would have debased German art by his presence alone. With architecture, sculpture became the most visible expression of Nazi ideology. A more public art form than painting, it was better at expressing the idea of race and health and did so in a more lasting material. These self-conscious sculptures played on feelings of eternity and of tradition. They were modelled on antiquity, messengers from a perfect world. They defined the image of the new German race, Nordic equivalents of the Greek gods. In these pin-ups, the private world of muscle magazines was put on public display. My artists shall live like aristocrats, Hitler had said, and the leading artists of the Reich did precisely that. The giant so-called state studios were built for Arno Breker and Josef Torak, the regime's leading sculptors. Here, Torak worked on his gigantic sculptures destined for the Nuremberg Stadium. Arno Breker was the regime's most popular sculptor. His work adorned the major party buildings. He was an artist of undoubted ability, a follower of Rodin and Mayol. Under the influence of the Nazi aesthetic, he abandoned the sensitive surfaces and individual expression of his earlier portraits and developed a declamatory, bombastic style. His particular contribution to the orchestration of power was to give a refined expression to brute force. war absorbed most of the country's vitality. It had never curtailed the regime's manipulation of people through the fine arts. The popularity of the official annual exhibition did not diminish either and attracted up to a million visitors. Das festliche Haus der deutschen Kunst wirkt auch im vierten Kriegsjahr die Schöpfungen führender deutscher Maler und Bildhauer. Even in the war, the House of German Art opens its doors. The whole country takes part in this act of creation. 
young and old, people in all walks of life, find the art which speaks to their heart. Junge und alte Menschen aus allen Schichten eilen sie herbei. Jeder findet ein Werk, das zu seinem Herzen spricht. Reichsminister Dr. Goebbels sagte in seiner Dr. Goebbels said that the making of culture in wartime is a sign of our undiminished strength and security. Art is the eternal and unchanging expression of our national will. Als der ewige und unveränderliche Ausdruck unseres völkischen Lebens. Despite the fact that art was forced on a large number of people, no new art emerged. There was no renaissance. Most paintings, architecture and films were pitifully mediocre. Every proclamation, every building, everything told the same story. The real art was done by those Germans who'd bravely turned their backs on a regime which betrayed humanity and civilization. Some hoped that the war would generate a new kind of painting. But the war paintings were just as undemanding and full of stereotyped cliches as the genre paintings. In any case, aesthetic judgments are impossible. We cannot look at the art produced in the Third Reich objectively. Our response is overshadowed by what we now know. Artistic and political content remain inseparable. And this is precisely what Hitler intended. What is so frightening about the art produced under him is its banality, its ordinariness. And that is what attracted so many. The masses and the leadership evidently shared the same tastes. Art finally revealed its real purpose. Again and again, the soldier is shown as the ideal German. In his readiness to fight and die for the nation, he displayed the highest virtue. The suffering of war or even death was only rarely portrayed. The readiness for sacrifice was the only thing that mattered. In the beginning, art had synchronized the masses into marching behind the Fuhrer. It now invited the whole nation to die. A group of soldiers are lost behind enemy lines. They're saved by one of their own. country in ruins and millions dead, feature films like this use the German arts to foster and authorize yet more self-sacrifice and destruction. Oh, no.